you a lot of joy. And God gets all the praise. Isn't that right? Praise God. Uh, here's your book. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so let's see. Now, we have some amazing things to study and to see th this afternoon. Um, National Sunday Law. Do you know what got me into that subject many years ago? I was concerned for my dear mama and my daddy. Uh, especially my father. His, uh, we, I couldn't judge anything, but he didn't talk or act like a Christian. Uh, his fruits were not in that way. And so I was concerned and I got thinking, uh, what about what's going to happen to my mom and daddy when this Sunday law comes? Or is it going to cause them to be converted at the last minute? Uh, what's going to happen to my mama and daddy? And so I got a book that talks about what's going to happen surrounding these events. It's called The Great What? The Great Controversy. Um, if any, everyone in the world would read that book, I would have never written National Sunday Law. But they won't read it because I've done experiments. Uh, as, as soon after my own conversion, I, uh, I didn't have the Sunday Law book, but I went and I got as many paperback great controversies as I could, and I put them on doorsteps because I prayed, Lord, how in the world are we going to reach the people with the three angels' messages? I can't tell it to them. They won't listen even if I knew what it was I, or could explain it. I'd take an hour or two, and they, they won't listen. They don't. And so uh, what can I do, Lord? And so the Lord impressed me, take it and just put it on their doorstep and leave and don't see anybody. And let the Holy Spirit, the angels and the book do the work. You see, my part was very tiny. All I did was put it there and God does all the rest. And that's all he needs. Just our tiny, tiny little part. And you know, it doesn't earn you heaven, doesn't earn you anything. But through that little act, God can save souls. And so I started putting great controversies on their doorsteps and I'd come back a week later or so and I'd ask them, uh, did you find it? Did you read it? Lord, would you like more information? I found that people started to read it, the great controversy, but it's written in the 18th century, uh, uh, 19th century style of the 1800s and they got bogged down in the dark ages and they never got to the last part that they desperately need to get. They didn't ever get it. And so I thought, now well, what are we going to do? And so, so anyway, um, in my July newsletter, which you will receive by God's grace, I tell about what happened to lead me to write that book. So I won't mention it now. But uh, anyway, God gets all the praise. Now there's, what, 41 and a half million in print in 70 languages. And God's been pushing them out, pushing them to all these countries. I didn't do that. God is doing it. If God is not in something, it won't work unless the devil pushes it. But if God is something in something that'll do what he wanted to be done and get the three angels much, he's going to push it. And so he's been pushing it. And uh, so for about, what, 20 years now, we've been sending out over a million every year. Uh, bulk mailing them as well as people getting them from office. And in my newsletters, you're going to see many, many letters that are coming in constantly about people that are now Seventh-day Adventists who were Roman Catholic, who were Muslims, who were Baptists, who were Methodists, who were all kinds of things, and their eyes are open and they, they join us. I mean, what better? <laughs> you couldn't get a better Christmas present. So God gets the praise, and I'm glad that you know now what this is about. And in the letter, you'll not only see all these testimony letters, you'll see the latest things happening leading to this law. As I mentioned this morning, uh, do you think the government is ever going to take away our buildings? Yes. Um, they're going to take our homes. Uh, they're going to take everything. Uh, and uh, but it won't bother us. Like I said this morning, we have nothing to fear at all. Those in Jesus have nothing to fear. Nothing can touch them. They can never be in a situation that's not safe. Those who don't have Jesus can never be in a situation that is safe. It's that critical. And so thank God we can cling to Jesus. Time hasn't run out yet. National Sunday Law. Now, this prophecy in the Bible is based, uh, of course, on prophecies. And in the prophecy, God shows great beasts, as you see in this picture. 
uh, there's a, a, a beast, great beast with seven heads and ten horns. And you know those beasts of Daniel and the beast of Revelation 13. Um, in Revelation 13, it reveals that the time is coming when we won't be able to buy or sell. It brings to view the National Sunday Law. It brings to view the warning against worshiping the beast, the warning against worshiping his image, the warning against receiving the mark of the beast. In chapter 13 of Revelation, it brings to view the fact that we won't be able to buy or sell after this law is passed. And in verse 15, Revelation 13 brings to view the fact that they're going to sentence us to death. But after probation closes, none of us will die. Did you know that? Isn't that nice? When you know that probation for the world is closed, n not even one of God's people will ever, ever die again. How will you feel, brother, if you know I'm alive and I'm never going to die? How would that make you feel? Oh, yeah, you might be tempted to leap up and down. I'm never going to die. Uh, if you're alive in Jesus, w keeping his holy Sabbath, which is the seventh day, and that's Saturday. If you're alive in Jesus, keeping his law in your hearts, uh, you're never going to die if you know that probation for the world has closed. And what is the main way you're going to learn probation is closed when the first plague falls? And what is that first plague? Terrible blank all over their bodies. So, boil, sores all over their bodies. The second plague is the water turned to blood. The third plague is the streams turned to blood. They turn on their spigot for some relief and out comes the oozing blood of a dead man. The third plague. The fourth man plague, uh, the sun scorches men with great heat. This all is in Revelation chapter what? 16. So in 13, it brings to view the beast, the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, the Sunday law, the <clears throat> boy, economic boycott and the death decree, all in Revelation 13. Revelation 14, and we need to be studying these chapters, don't you think so? Uh, the devil will try to keep people away from it. Many uh, Sunday preachers tell the people, don't study Revelation. If you study that, you'll go crazy. Uh, and that's just what the devil wants them to say. So we need to study it. Daniel and Revelation, it gives you a re tremendous revival. Um, uh, the prophet says if pastors would study those two books with the congregation, and bring revival. Uh, but the, of course, the devil doesn't want that kind of thing. Anyway, chapter 14 uh, brings to view the 144,000 along with chapter 7. And 14 also brings to view the message that the 144,000 are going to be giving which is the three angels' messages. Chapter 15 brings to view the uh, prelude to the seven plagues, and chapter 16 brings to view the seven last plagues. And the seventh plague is Jesus appearing, which his appearing will kill everyone that the other plagues didn't kill of the wicked. Uh, chapter, okay, that's uh, 16. Then chapter 17 tells us who is responsible for this Sunday law, who's behind the whole wicked thing. And in chapter 17, we learn that this woman, and in prophecy, a woman represents what? Church. Church. This woman is riding on a what? A beast out of the bottomless pit, you might say. It's, and uh, can anyone tell me who that beast is? Okay, there's three. Oh, I see. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, the, be the, the, the beast the woman is riding on, so you see here's a church riding a beast. Here's a church controlling a government. Because a beast is a government in prophecy. So a church is controlling a government, guiding it around, telling government what to do. And what government is this beast? It's the Vatican. The Vatican is a government. It doesn't have, it's not a very big one. It's only 20-some acres. But you wouldn't believe what goes on in that government. In uh, a recent letter, I, in fact, um, I think it was Life magazine, uh, had a whole big magazine. It was either Time or Life. It says, Secrets of the Vatican, right on Time magazine, on the front cover. And I just shared things that were in that magazine. It's amazing what they put for the whole world to read right in the magazine. And so this is Rev chapter 17, uh, the beast and this woman riding it. And uh, also at the end of 17, it says that this woman is also a city. And this woman's name is Babylon. And the city in chapter 18, its name is Babylon. 
So the women in the city of chapter 18 are the same power, the Roman Catholic power. Um, and then in the end of chapter 18, verse 23, it says, For by thy sorceries. Do you know what that word means? In Greek, that word sorceries is what? What's the Greek word? Is what? Pharmakia. Pharmakia. That's where we get our English word pharmacy, pharmaceutical, drugs. For by thy sorceries, by thy pharmakia, were all nations deceived, and they're being that way. For in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. There's so much in there packed that the devil doesn't dare want anyone to understand what's in there. And these are the things that I explain in my monthly letter, that you're going to have your eyes open more and more to these wonderful things of what? A comic book or the Bible? The Bible, the Word of God. Praise the Lord that God wrote, wrote these two books, Daniel and Revelation. Okay, now, so we see these beasts here. And this woman standing on the moon, that's God's church, uh, clothed with the sun. Then what are we going to find? It says, Then I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, upon his ten hor horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. I could spend a long time just ex talk going through that one sentence verse, but we won't now. You know what that means. It says, most of you already know that this beast which came out of the sea represents papal Rome. The beast in chapter 13 that came out of the earth represents what? United States. And, um, okay, so it may, God makes it so clear that even a child can see it. On May 23rd last year, there was a special group called the John 17 Movement. After gathering in Phoenix, the religious leaders from the Catholic and Protestant churches uh, received a personal message from the Pope encouraging Christian unity. Listen now to some of the message the Pope sent to these church leaders. All right? Uh, it's not going to work unless you have a mouse and you push play underneath that picture. There you go. Okay, it's all right. <laughs> we'll just skip. I, now, I, I tell you what, I can go back to him to see if you can find the... There it is, okay. Queridos hermanos, la desunión es una herida en el cuerpo de la Iglesia de Cristo. Y nosotros no queremos que esa herida permanezca. Here the Pope is appealing to both Catholics and Protestant churches in North America to unite, saying that this division between our churches is a wound in the body of Christ that needs to be healed. There's a push to disregard and downplay the teachings of the Word of God in preference for unity. There's going to be a crisis that's going to make the divided churches come together, looking to the central figure as head of those churches, the Pope of Rome. That's what the Vatican is working for through these great calamities, which a lot of them have to do with, uh, they present a solution, have the Pope as a unifying factor to unite all the churches in love and unity. Forget the law of God, forget the commandments, just unite in unity. That's their great message for peace and safety. Uh, now, who are those two people? Do you recognize those people there? This is just a little sign of this unity that is coming. Uh, it says, the prophet of God said, quote, the Protestant churches are in great darkness, or they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She's employing every device, notice the word every, to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict. Number one, to regain control of the world. That's what Rome is seeking. Number two, to reestablish persecution. That's what Rome is doing. Number three, to undo all that Protestantism has done that are the three goals of Rome right now as I speak. They've been working on these three goals for many, many years and gradually they are getting them. Control of the world, reestablishing persecution, but they don't persecute Protestants, at least not in the U.S., openly. They don't want anyone to know that it's coming from Rome. They use agents that are not, or don't claim to be Catholics so that if anyone tries to trace it back, it only comes as someone who claims to be Protestant. 
but is not known as a Catholic. That's the way they're working. Everything has to be uh, undercover, secretive, because in Revelation 17, verse 5, it gives the name of this woman right on her forehead in great big capital letters. Can anyone tell me what that word is? A little bit before that. The great big word is the word mystery. 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 That's the word. That's her name is mystery. Everything is mysterious. It's undercover, behind the scenes. For instance, who would imagine that the, all the Masonic uh, branches of masonry the head of all of them is the Pope of Rome. Nobody knows that hardly. He is the head of all masonry. He wears the ephod, the Pope of Rome. And they come out openly against masonry, but in the Vatican they have Masonic lodges for their cardinals. The ex Jesuit priest that I've exposed, his name is Alberto Rivera, he got out of there. He was an honest man. He said when he knelt down to kiss the ring of the head Jesuit, he had a Masonic ring on his finger. Yet they speak against and they fight against masonry. They fight against abortion. And nobody realizes that priests and nuns have had more abortions than anyone in the world. Even now there's thousands of, of skeletons of babies under their convents. Um, and so whatever they're doing, they're speaking against it at the same time for a smoke. And what's the next word? A smoke screen put up many smoke screens. Whatever they're doing, they're speaking against it. Um, all of these things. They speak against drugs. Their mafia is dealing with more drugs than anyone in the world. Uh, anyway, let's go on. Uh, it says, all right, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you uh, quite a few uh, uh, quotes, documentation uh, about this country and especially other countries that are working for a Sunday law. And of course, you know, Rome is behind the whole thing. Uh, this is the Toronto Star in Canada. It says, make Sundays for families. And so they bring it forth for a good purpose, uh, for the families, for rest, for health, for better uh, uh, economics, and rest so that we can do better work. And all these good things. The prophet reveals that the Sunday wall will be pushed uh, on excuse of something good. It's always something good, a good reason. Uh, the following documentation is from the spring publication of uh, 2011 of Pilgrim's Rest. It says, Vatican exhorts, exhorts Catholics to set aside Sundays for God and rest. I'm not going to read all of them because I have so many, but I'll read to you especially the headlines. Uh, Israeli government consider making Sunday a day of rest. Even the Israel, can you imagine that? And they keep, supposedly keep Saturday that like we do. But uh, Sunday law even coming to, to Israel. Who would ever think of that? The Republic of Fiji, decree number 20, Sunday observance decree. It says, Sunday shall be observed in the Republic of Fiji as a sacred day and a day of worship and thanksgiving to Christ the Lord. This decree shall come into force on October 29, 1987. Okay, the next one, Sunday Protection Conference to be held on June 20, 2011. And um, it says, things are definitely happening in the EU regarding the Sunday law issue. Um, don't forget that America leads the world in worship of the Pope and the Catholic Church, uh, shown in Revelation 13. Then the quote from Testimonies, uh, volume 6, page 18. It says, as America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the consequences consciences of men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. They're already working on it openly. Now, in the U.S., they had to be more tricky because uh, the devil has, can't be on the open in the U.S. like he can in other countries. Now, back in the 1980s and 90s, he was more, much more in the, in the open. In my newsletters from the late 80s and 90s, Almost everyone had newspaper articles just, just like this, pushing for the Sunday law here in this country, shaping things for it. But the devil saw he was shooting himself in the what? In the foot <laughs> with, these push, with these movements in the U.S. because he knew that certain Seventh-day Adventists were exposing him. 
Do you think we ought to do something like that? And so he pulled back. And he stopped doing it so much in the US, U.S. And you don't see much anymore. At least not in the regular papers like we used to in the 90s. Uh, but things are happening undercover. Like in that big word on her forehead, mystery. So it says, Sunday protection on the agenda at the European Christian Economy and Employment Network. And uh, so it talks about that. Here on the bottom it says, The assembly will include sessions on Sunday protection. That's in Europe. It says Belfast. That's in Ireland. Uh, we're going to go. Many, many countries are doing this. Here, Ireland, Belfast. City council refuses to scrap Sunday trading laws. Uh, and uh, talks about that. Then the next one, Catholic workers movement. Fighting for Sunday in Brussels. Brussels, that's a country of itself, isn't it? So they're doing it there. Pope Benedict admits that the seventh day Saturday is the true Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? Yes, they will admit that, but then they say that they have power to change it. Here at the bottom, it says, uh, well, I'm going to read the whole thing. It says, if one considers the importance that Saturday has in the Old Testament tradition, this is the Pope talking, based on the account of the creation and on the Decalogue, it is evident that only an event of overwhelming force could cause giving up Saturday and replacing it by the first day of the week. Interesting. What is this event of overwhelming force? It would be the beast of Revelation 13, uh, the pa uh, ca Catholic power. It says Sunday Alliance Action Day planned for the 3rd of March in German communities and in Germany also. Um, here it says... Well, actually, back here, it says Free Sunday celebrates its birthday 1,690 years ago. On the 3rd of March, 321, the Roman Emperor Constantine declared Sunday a day, of all, day off. This marks the beginning of the state Sunday protection. 1,690 years later, the Free Sunday is threatened by Sunday work and Sunday commercialism. So these are the reasons they're using in all these different countries. Then the next one is in France. IKEA. France convicted for violation of the Sunday rest law. That's from Retail Detail, September 7, 2014. Then the next one is from Israel again. Uh, proposal for Saturday, Sunday weekend in the paper called The Times of Israel. Uh, then it says hundreds of people protest shops opening on Sunday in Athens, Greece. There it's in Greece. The next one says trade and industry board members support Sunday rest bill as shop close in Argentina. Now we go down to South America. And uh, then European Trade Union Confederation pushing for Sunday law in Europe. Another one, it says deal reached to give Israelis one Sunday as a day of rest every month. Uh, State Council in France rules that Sunday opening goes against the principles of a weekly day of rest. 15th Annual World Sabbath Interfaith Service, Michigan, that's in Michigan in the United States. Here, European bishops demand respect for Sunday rest with support of trade unions. Uh, uh, did you ever know that the unions are going to have to do, have anything to do with it? Yes, you've known that the unions. Uh, the prophet reveals that unions will bring a great time of trouble in their evil work. And people don't know that Rome is controlling the unions as well. But they are. Uh, it says... And notice that, how do you know? Uh, notice in Revelation 18, 24, it says, For in her was the blood of prophets and of saints and of, what's the next word? All that were slain upon the earth. What does the word all mean? It means all. Amazing. It says, uh, UK Court of Appeal recognizes by law Sunday as a Christian day of rest, the court in the United Kingdom, that's England. Sunday rest bill gets preliminary approval in Santa Fe, Argentina, down in South America again. Large city in India, now we go to India, to enforce a strict Sunday closure law from 18, 1988. It says Vatican works with unions to stop Sunday shopping in Italy. Of course, we would expect Italy to do that where Rome is. A reformed political party in Netherlands want to shut all shops on Sundays in order for citizens to go to church. 
landmark decision. Austria, uh, it's a, that's right, near, uh, Germany. Court supports ban on Sunday shop opening. Sunday must be a day of rest dedicated to God and family, the Pope says, 2012. Sunday designated as a day of rest in the tornado ravaged Harveyville. What's the next word? Kansas. That's in the U.S. Uh, so it's a Sunday designated as a day of rest there. Of course, in the minds of most people, uh, that is true. Uh, here on the bottom there, it's a quote from the great controversy. It says, it will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. And that, I've already seen that type of thing in a, in a paper. It says, a community in Brooklyn, New York, to report any restaurants breaking the Sunday Blue Law. That was interesting, right in Brooklyn. Uh, M Municipal Council in Germany, Fried Freiburg, voted against any shop opening on Sundays. It says, shops must remain, shops remain closed on Sundays in 2012 in several German cities. This is a result of the decisions in the multi to uh, municipal councils that were taken recently in some German cities. Then a call for action, March 4, 2012, European Day for a work-free Sunday. Uh, Alabama judge to send offenders to church on Sunday instead of jail. That was interesting, wasn't it? Go to church instead of jail. North Dakota Catholic Conference says Sunday law benefits all people. In, in, I'm sorry, North Dakota Catholic Conference. And what is that? That is a church sign. And I'm going to read to you what it says. Our Lady of Martyrs Catholic Church. This week's sermon, National Sunday Law, is it time? That is amazing. Right on the Catholic Church sign. National Sunday Law, is it time? That was a sermon for that Sunday. And there in the blue letters, it gives the um, website address. Of course, they change their uh, sermon title every week, so you won't find it on that s sign now, but for one Sunday, they had that on there. S National Sunday Law. Is it time? Is it time in Rome's mind? Is it time in the devil's mind? Yes, there's only one thing holding it back, and that's God using his people to give the warning. You see, we, the people haven't been warned yet. They haven't gotten the message yet. And so God is going to make sure that everyone, because He loves the dear people. He loves you. He loves you so much. He loves all the people. He's going to make sure that people will get the message and have an intelligent uh, decision that no one will be tricked into it, but everyone will make an intelligent decision. It says, what will our kind Father do about things like this? Here it is. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, receive his mark in his forehead or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That is the third angel's message. And when I was a boy, like I told you, I'm a fifth generation Seventh-day Adventist, but it was love for my parents that got me studying this thing. And as I read that third angel's message, I thought to myself, how in the world are we going to get that to people in a way that they understand? For instance, if I went and rang a doorbell and I said, hello, I'm going to give you the third angel's message. How would the person at the door feel then? Suppose a man came to your door and said those words. Would you say, oh, that's wonderful. You think that's what people will say? Absolutely not. They'll slam the door in his face or call the police or something. Well, suppose you don't tell them you're going to give them the three, third angel's message. Suppose you just ring the doorbell and they open the door and they say, hello, can I help you? And you just start reading it to them. And you read the whole thing. They say, hello, can I help you? Yes, listen, 
And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now you've just gotten the third angel's message. Did she get it? She got nothing. She didn't understand a word I said. So I prayed, Lord, how in the world are we going to get this, which you've commanded us to do, get to the people? How are we going to get that to anybody? I can't tell them. They don't have time. They won't listen. Or they don't understand. And so that's why the Lord said, take it. Something written so simple that even a child can understand it and put it on their doorstep and leave and let God do the work. That's why we've been doing that. That's why we put the National Sunday Law book on the doorstep in the benches in different places. And do you think the devil likes that method? He hates it. He hates it because he can't stop it. It's wonderful. It gives you great joy. And bashful people like me can do it. Isn't that right? Bashful boy can do it. Um, all right. Here it says... Um, by the way, that's why I'm giving you a couple hundred of these books free to, today. Like I said this morning, now is no time to live for money. If you live for money now, you'll die with your money. If you live for ease and pleasure, you'll end up with the mark of the beast. If you live for Christ, you'll live forever. It's worth it, isn't it? Oh, yes. Worth it. Uh, how important is God's last message of the th three angels to the world? Oh, it's important, all right. You're going to see that it's a life or death message. Those who reject that message and go along with the Sunday law to receive the mark of the beast will receive the seven last plagues. Those who accept God's message will be protected by God and will be saved from this earth to live in a most gorgeous paradise with God forever. So it's very worth it. it says, now I'm going to give you quotes describing what the prophet saw in vision, things that are going to happen to the wicked after the Sunday law is passed. Now, I've been talking about what's coming before the Sunday law. Now we're going to change gears, and now I'm going to tell you things that are going to happen after the Sunday law. And I'm going to give you these quotes here. It says, if you're abiding in Jesus, you'll see some of the, these people or some of these things with your own eyes, but they won't hurt you. Keep that in mind. We have nothing to fear. If you're not in Christ, you have lots to fear. Everything to fear. But in Jesus, you have nothing to fear. It says, after you see these quotes of what's coming to the wicked, you'll see a three-minute video clip illustrating these very things that the prophet saw. Uh, and this video clip, do you know where I got it? First, I'm going to be quoting to you from the spirit of prophecy, things that are going to actually be coming, things which the prophet saw herself with her own eyes. And then I'm going to show you on the screen these very things. Where do you think I got these pictures? I got them from Hollywood. Now, you might say, why would Hollywood show us what God showed the prophet of God? I'll tell you why. It's just like God gives us a hint in the Bible with the king, with a king. Which king? King Saul, the first king. He, poor thing, he, God blessed him at first, but he turned away from the Lord and kept doing wrong, doing wrong, until finally God wouldn't answer him anymore because of his stubborn heart. Finally, the Philistines were coming and he couldn't get any help. And finally, he went to visit a what? A witch the witch of Endor, in a cave. And he went in there, and, he, and the woman was afraid because the devil told her who this was. And she said, Saul has killed all the witches. And he said, oh, don't worry, I won't hurt you. I've got I've to have you bring up Samuel. I've, I've got to have some help. God won't answer me. Please bring up Samuel. Maybe he can help me. It looks like Saul would know that it wasn't Samuel. Wouldn't he know that? Who was it that, uh, that came up? It was one of the devil's angels masquerading as Samuel. And that, by the way, that's going to be happening more and more. I know Seventh-day Adventists right now that have uh, some of their dead loved ones appeared to them. It was Satan's angels. And they knew it was Satan's angel, but it was so real. It was, you know, it boggled their minds. One was a lady and her dead mother appeared to her and, and started talking with a sweet 
uh, loving tones of voice like she always was used to. And it could, she could hardly persuade herself it wasn't her real mother. And finally, instead of saying, get thee hence, Satan, she didn't do that. She said, go back in the cemetery. <laughs> go back in the cemetery. And so finally the thing disappeared. It was just Satan's angel. My own father had a similar thing. He was lying in the bed and on the wall was a picture of him and my mother. My mother died in the year 2000. And this, he had this in about 2008 or 9, 8 I believe. And he told me, he said, Jan, he said, I was looking at that picture and all of a sudden your mother started talking to me. And uh, he knew that it was one of Satan's angels. Anyway, this kind of thing is going to happen. If it happens to you, just say, Get thee and Satan in Jesus' name, for it is written, The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not what? Anything. And the thing will go in Jesus' holy name. Praise God. Well, here, uh, so I'm going to show you some of these quotes. And uh, oh, and I, I almost forgot why I was telling you this, because when King Saul was in the cave with a witch and she supposedly brought forth Samuel, if you read it, I believe it's in Second Kings, the devil tells Saul, King Saul, I mean, every word he tells King Saul is the absolute truth. He tells him the pure truth, every word. You might say, why would the devil give the pure truth? Because Satan can use the truth to destroy. Did you know that? That's why Jesus said to the disciples, I have many things to, sh to tell you, but you cannot, what? You cannot bear them now. You see, with you, if you're in tune with God, you won't just be blurting out everything. That's not wise at all. It's foolish. You can do more damage sometimes that way. Um, uh, you need the wisdom of God and pray, Lord, give me wisdom, what to say and what not to say. And God will give you wisdom. And so by the devil telling Saul the total pure truth, truth, you're going to be with me tomorrow. You're going to be dead. It was the truth. It discouraged Saul so much that he had no power at all. You see, the truth, too much truth, or the truth in a wrong way or at the wrong time can actually discourage somebody. So with the wisdom of God, you can know how much to tell them and what to not to tell them until a little bit later when the right time comes. Does that make sense? Yeah, praise God. Okay, here we go in what the prophet saw. And then I'm going to show you a, a video clip of the same things. Here the prophet said, now this is after the Sunday law. In fact, it's uh, a lot of it is after the pro pro probation closes and some of these calamities will come before it closes. Here it says, every city is to be turned upside down in every way. How many cities? Every single one. That's shocking, isn't it? Turned upside down. In how many ways? Every way. I mean, just total chaos. It says, everything that can be shaken is to be shaken, and we do not know what will come next. The judgments will be according to the wickedness of the people and the light of truth that they've had. The people in our, near, our dear, precious United States have had more light than anyone in the world. So it's amazing what's going to happen even here. As, uh, the, it will be according to the light. Here is an a earthquake. I, don't, I think that was in Los Angeles. There's this poor policeman looking down of the overpass that broke in half. Uh, things like this will be happening all the time. Oh, that God's people had a sense of the impending destruction of thousands of cities now almost given to idolatry. The time is near when large cities will be swept away and all should be what? Warn of these coming judgments. Now, Roman Catholic agents have gone out to the Protestant churches and they've said, uh, influence the pastors, do not give any warning. Only give love and unity, but no warning. Don't give the people any warning. Only love and unity. How does that sound? Has that been happening? That's why uh, it says here, oh, that God's people had a sense of the impending destruction of thousands almost given to idolatry. The time is near when large cities will be swept away and all should be, notice the word all, should be what? Warned. There it is. All should be warned of these coming judgments. When you give the people a warning, do it so sweetly and so kindly 
and so gently. You see, the fanatics, they do it all right, but they do it like the devil. Don't be like that. You see, by doing it with a spirit like Satan, they can cause people to quit doing it at all. You see, that's the devil's purpose. To get people to give the warning like the devil would do it so that you'll stop the true Christians from doing it. That's the way the devil works. That's what they call psychology. It says all should be warned of these coming judgments. It says fires will break out unexpectedly and no human effort will be able to quench them. The palaces of earth will be swept away in the fury of the flames. Confusion, collision, and death without a moment's warning will occur on the great lines of travel. That's happening now. The end is near. Probation is closing. Oh, let us seek God while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Now, the devil knows that these strong and wonderful warnings from God himself and from dear Jesus will help wake the people up. So, uh, he, 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 uh, 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 if he can't get people to do anything else, what he'll do is just get people to reject the entire spirit of prophecy. If you know anybody that did that, just rejected the spirit of prophecy. After a person rejects the spirit of prophecy, what's the next thing he'll reject? The Bible. Then what's the uh, next thing after that he'll reject? God himself. They'll turn to atheists. Uh, I was in a, in a classroom where people were giving great insinuations about against the spirit of prophecy. And uh, the very next week, Sweet Vanita was there. I won't tell you where it was. She was in that same class because I said, I'm not going back there anymore. And uh, so she was there. And that day when she was there, they didn't attack the spirit of prophecy. Guess what they attacked? The Bible. So Vanita, she couldn't sit there like a dunce or an uh, ostrich with its head in a hole. She picked up the Bible and she held it up. And she said, if we don't honor the Bible, we might as well all go home. Is that true? Yes. So we must honor what God says. It says, I could see houses shaken like a reed in the wind. Buildings, great and small, were falling to the ground. Pleasure resorts, theaters, hotels, and homes of the wealthy were shaken and shattered. Many lives were blotted out of existence. The air was filled with shrieks of the injured and the terrified. God's prophet saw these things with her own eyes. Why do you think God wanted her to t the prophet to tell us these things? Do we need to know these things? Does it help us to know them? It does. I'd rather be knowing what's going on than be in ignorance, wouldn't you? There's no strength in ignorance. There's only fear in ignorance. It says the whole earth heaves and swells like the waves of the sea. In this video I'm going to show you, you're going to see that. The earth going up and down like the waves. Its surface is breaking up. Its very foundations seem to be giving way. The seaports that have become like Sodom for wickedness are swallowed up by the angry waters. Babylon the Great has come in remembrance before God. Great hailstones, every one about the weight of a talent. I've heard that that's about 60 pounds, like a bowling ball, a 60-pound hailstone. Uh, it says, doing their work of destruction. It says, the proudest cities of the earth are laid low. The lordly palaces upon which the earth, world's great men have lavished their wealth, are crumbling to ruin before their eyes. Crim prison walls are run asunder. And God's people have been held in bondage for their faith are set free. Praise God. When you're set free from in jail because of honoring God's Sabbath, and these things come and the prison wall tumble down, and you get out of there, and you see Jesus coming, how will you feel? Oh, I tell you, you'll say, look, this is our God. We've waited for him, and he will save us. We will be ready in that day. Isn't that right? We will be ready. And God allows these horrors so that as a contrast, you see the beautiful contrast. Let's just say here's a, a bowl of mud. And I look at this mud with moss and, and gangrene and mold on it. And then I look at these beautiful roses. Ah, it smells so good. I can appreciate the, wor the roses more. After looking at the mud, isn't that right? Yeah, you appreciate it more. That's why God allows this. Because when Jesus comes, oh, how much we're going to appreciate it. We'll say, praise God, praise God. Now, it says we've just read that the prophet saw the ground going up and down, fire, flood, tidal waves, swallowing up cities, mountains shaking. Now, in the next three minutes, you're going to see with your eyes these very things illustrated. Are you ready? Okay, Brother Brandon, get ready for the 
audio. We want enough audio. So are you ready, Brother Brandon? Here we go. Two months ago, I was made aware of a situation so devastating that at first, I refused to believe it. However, through the concerted efforts of our brightest scientists, we have confirmed its validity. The world as we know it will soon come to an end. for Jesus, for his promises. What you saw was exactly what the prophet described, all of those different things. And that helps us have a love for, for, for souls. Oh, dear Father, give us a love for souls. Come into our heart, dear Jesus. Bless and use us to reach the people. Thank you, dear Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Yes, pray that prayer, love for souls, and he'll do it. And you know now, a thousand shall fall at thy side, 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. We're perfectly safe in Jesus. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Only with your eyes. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come even near your dwelling. He shall give his chain, uh, angels charge over thee, it says. The wicked have beaten the Holy Spirit away. Uh, he gives them the master they've chosen. What can we do to help ourselves and others be ready for what's coming? Well, number one, abide closely in the Lord with prayer, Bible study, and sharing your faith with others. Without this, you drift away from the Lord, and you'll get into discouragement, depression, and darkness. But having these three things of prayer, Bible study, and sharing your faith with others, you'll have joy and peace and love in your heart. Uh, number two, have a happy home with the five things of kindness, patience, humility, love, and sweetness to all, especially in your home. Never wait, raise your voice or have an irritable spirit with your spouse or children. 
A lot of people think that they've got to yell at their children. They don't realize it's just driving their children to the devil. But if they treat their children like they're intelligent and just sit down with a soft, loving voice and talk to them about the thing and about what God says and God's love to them, it'll do much better than yelling at them. It says, um, uh, with these things, your home can be a path leading to the gates of heaven. It says, the prophet of God cries out, are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? Of what value will our words be then? Shall we wait until judge God's judgments fall upon the transgressor before we tell him how to avoid them? The love of Christ, the love of our brethren, will testify to the world that we've been with Jesus and learned of him. Then will the message of the third angel swell to a loud cry, and the whole earth will be lightened with the glory of the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? That message that I prayed, Lord, how in the world are we going to get that? Shocking message to the people. Well, this gives us the answer. And it's going to be done. In fact, I'm going to tell you something that might surprise you. But it's this. And I wasn't planning to tell you this, but I think I'm going to tell you. I didn't look up the reference. You can look it up if you have a CD-ROM of, of the prophet's writings. But it reveals, the prophet says, angels, God's angels will do a work that men might have had the privilege of doing. Do you comprehend that? That means, how many people are in the world now? Seven and a half billion. Um, how many languages do they speak around the world? Over 6,000. Uh, there is not enough Seventh-day Adventists to reach even part of them. Plus, we only, around the world, we only speak like less than 800 languages, and there's over 6,000. So if God doesn't do something, we're going backwards. Jesus will never come unless God does a miracle. Is God going to take things in his own hands and do a miracle? Yes, he is. In the Bible, it says God will cut the work, what? Short in righteousness. The word righteousness just means to do right. What would be the right thing for God to do? Will he actually send angels in human form to do what we cannot do? The prophet said angels will do a work that men might have had the privilege of doing. Another quote says the armies of the living God take the field. Praise God. They're going to take the field by the millions. An angel. Can bullets hurt them? Can handcuffs hold them? What about bars? Uh, if a policeman arrests one of them and puts him in the back of his police car and the policeman is driving along and looks back, there's nobody there. Where'd he go? You can't hurt an angel. Angels will do a work that men might have done. Are you glad I told you that? That's encouraging. Because in actuality, we're going backwards. There's more people being born every day than what we're reaching. We're going backwards. But thank God, he's going to take things in his own hands, and I thank God for it. There is a line in the sand. And after that, we get to that line, God's not going to hesitate any longer. Things are going to happen. He's going to let the devil do certain things, and God's going to do certain things. And whatever God does, and whatever he allows the devil to do, is only going to be a blessing to God's people. It'll only drive us very close to Jesus, and it'll keep us there. Like if you're in jail, won't that keep you there in close to Jesus every single day? Every hour of every day? I tell you, you'll be close to Jesus. All right. And not everybody's going to jail. Uh, a number of people, and this is in the last five chapters of Great Controversy. Uh, it's very plain. A number of you will never go to jail. A number of you will be together in little groups in homes. Or in the woods. Or in some desolate place like that. And you'll stay in these little groups until after probation closes. And the, peop the uh, wicked people will come and surround you with their guns. And they'll know that the death decree is passed at what time of day? Laws are always passed at what time? Midnight. And so it says the mighty God of Israel interposes at midnight. Isn't that something? The very moment that death decree goes into effect, that moment... The mighty God of Israel interposes. How do you feel about that? 
Really good. Praise God. You see, the message of God in Daniel Revelation is shocking to the ignorant, but it's good news to the honest. Isn't that right? It's good news. Good news. Chariots are coming. Remember that song? I love to hear the King's Heralds sing that song. Good news. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the message is going to be finished very quickly. It says the final movements will be blank ones. Rapid ones. Very rapid. And um, you and I can have a part in it. We don't have to sit like a bump on a log watching TV and saying, well, I'm going to heaven by grace. We are going by grace. But you're either going to work for God or the devil. Who are you going to work for? <laughs> Praise God. It doesn't earn you anything, but it gives you a lot of joy. And especially seeing how God uses you to bless and save somebody. Like the lady right here. You're a Seventh-day Adventist because you found the National Sunday Law book in a grocery store. Would you like to see the person who put it there? You'd love to? You'll probably never see him until you get to heaven. But in heaven, you're going to learn this dear person put this book right there just for you. And now you're a Seventh-day Adventist. Praise God. And so in heaven, I think you and that person will be good friends, won't you? Good friends. So this is part of the joy of working for Jesus. Uh, when the devil thinks that he can get away with a Sunday law, he'll bring the issue out in the open. And then what will happen? Well, here we go. God's going to move and look at this. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. Signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus, the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. The seed has been sown, and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever the bands that have held them. There's bands holding him right now. Their loved ones, their families, their churches, whatever. Those bands will be broken and they'll join us to keep all the, his holy Sabbath and all the commandments. It's his family connection, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all beside. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. Praise God. Isn't that wonderful? A large number. In last day events, page 180, the prophet says the majority forsake us. When the Sunday law comes, most everyone you've ever known will become a Sunday keeper. Now that's shocking, but it's the truth. That's what the prophet said. That's in last day events, page 180. Uh, a lot of things are happening. The God's church will be cleansed. In uh, 9T228, it says Jesus will come again. And cleanse his church like he did at the beginning and end of his ministry on the earth. Well, he did it twice. He stood in the doorway of the temple. And what did he have in his hand? A whip. And he went in there. And who ran out? Almost everybody. And who stayed in? The humble, the meek, the sick, the poor, the children, the godly, and Nicodemus. A religious leader, praise God, a godly religious leader. They stayed in, most everyone ran out. Will it be the same in our day when the Sunday law comes? When Jesus, like 9228, says, Jesus is going to do it again. He did it with a whip in his hand. What's going to be the whip in his hand this time? What will it be? It'll be the Sunday law, that's right. That whip will get rid of most every, uh, the foolish virgins. Pray that you'll be a wise virgin, amen. Who has the oil. And how do you get that oil? Filling your mind with the word of God. Abiding in Jesus. Enjoying him. Uh, working with him. Everything with him. It's all wrapped up in Jesus. This is really a good news message, isn't it? Good news message. Um, and so it says. Uh, a large number take their stand. Even though. How many Seventh Adventists are in the world right now? 18 million. All right. Uh, it says in last day 182. Last event, 180, uh, 180, it says the majority forsake us. What's the majority of 18 million? More than what? More than 9 million are going to forsake us. That'll put a big hole in us, won't it? 
But that's not the end of the news. In Isaiah 60, 61, it reveals a great movement going on. That so many are going to join us. It says your heart will melt. <laughs> You'll almost faint. The prophet says that so many are going to join us. This will be after the foolish virgins have left. They've gone along with the Sunday law. Now what's left is pure. They're pressing together. Lord, save us. Help us. We've lost our buildings. We've lost our homes. We don't know where we're going to meet. We can't buy and sell. Help us, Lord. I mean, they are close. You will be close with these dear people. It'll be wonderful. And God, uh, angels, angels will bring us our food many times. Imagine being in a prison. The angel comes and he sets his, your food down. And he said, here's your food. Hold on a little longer. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. He disappears. There's your food and water. Yes, we'll be very close to God and to each other. The, now the latter rain is poured out. The latter rain, read about it in Zechariah and in Joel chapter 2. The people in Joel 2 are so powerful. They're like a mighty army. It says they don't break their ranks. They're perfectly united. They're, <laughs> they're going to get the third angel's message to everybody. And nothing can hurt them. Nothing. They're working with the angels. And um, uh, it says so many will join us that the prophet says our numbers will not be blank. What's in the blank? Not be diminished. Over nine million leave. Over nine million join us. Isn't that something? That's encouraging, isn't it? These people are in all the different Sunday churches now. But they're waiting for us to reach them. Here it says, in view of what we just saw. And in view of the shortness of time. And the value of the soul. In view of the fact that Jesus shed his blood for us. On the cross of Calvary. How many of you are willing to take some of these little National Sunday Law books that I have out in the foyer and lay them in places where people can find them and pick them up, like benches, laundromats, restrooms, parking lots, any place people walk, wait, sit, or go, so Jesus can save them. How many of you are willing to take some of these little books home with you and do this this very week? Can I see your hand? Praise the Lord. I wish I had a 1,000 or 2,000 here. Normally, I bring two thousand. I mean, I bring a thousand with me to the church, and I called the office to make sure they sent a thousand. I was going to give you a thousand books. I don't know what happened, but the thousand didn't come. We only have two hundred, so I don't know how many are here. But each person take one, and if there's more, then take two. But at least take one or two with you, and you can get more later. And just pray over that. Read it yourself, of course. And to know what it is. And then put it somewhere. Lay it somewhere where someone can pick it up. Or if you know someone that's open, then give it to that person. And say, a good friend of mine wrote this book. Because I am your good friend. Isn't that right? He wrote it. And he wants to find out what people think. So if you'll read it, I'll ask you what you think later. And you can let me know. And so pray over it. And God will use you. And you'll see somebody in heaven. Heaven's a good place, don't you think so? What is that little le girl le oh, pointing at? She's pointing at Jesus coming. Won't that be a wonderful time? Jesus coming. Look at her. I tell you, when we see the face of Jesus, you'll feel like that. Yes, you'll see these great constellations and nebulas that God has made. Uh, one after another. You'll use your own wings and fly to these places and talk with these people that are thousands of years old. There I saw most glorious houses had appearance of silver supported by four pillars set with pearls. Most glorious to behold. You'll live in one of these mansions uh, inhabited by the saints. A glorious light shone all about their heads. They were continually shouting and offering praises to God. When you walk through the gate of the city of God and you look around, will you feel like shouting? <laughs> You're going to feel like it. You won't be a deadbeat, will you? You won't be a, uh, you know, just laying around. Oh, no, you'll praise God. It says, I mean, the wonderful things we're going to see is beyond comprehension. Mount Zion was just before us. And on the mount were a glorious temple. About it were seven other mountains on which grew roses and lilies. I saw the little ones climb, or if they chose, use their little wings. See, he's going to have wings. And fly to the top of the mountains and pluck 
the never fading flowers. Isn't that beautiful? Little toddlers, little babies, by the millions are going to be there. Do you think some of those babies don't even have a mother or father there? Do you think that'll be true? Yes, the angel will take these little ones to the tree of life. The angel will pick the fruit off the tree of life and give it to the baby and the baby will eat it. And the baby, some of these babies, uh, the angel will hold these babies and the baby will see the mother. And then what do you think the baby's going to do in the arms of the angel? It's going to start flapping his wings. I've got to start flapping my wings and he's going to fly right straight into mother's breast. Bang! And I mean, what a wonderful thing that'll be. Isn't that wonderful? You'll see these things with your own eyes. Uh, these nebulas and constellations will fly there with their own wings and visit the people of other planets. And I'm sure they'll ask you to stay for, stay for dinner. You'll eat with these dear people. They're real people. And we don't realize how real these things are. Uh, all of these things God has made, billions of them, all out throughout the universe. Heaven is a good place. I long to be there and behold my lovely Jesus who gave his life for me and be changed into his glorious image. Oh, for language to express the glory of the bright world to come. I thirst for the living streams that make glad the city of our God. Praise the Lord. That's in early writings. If you want to be thrilled with these things, get the book Early Writings and read that. Read the last Five chapters of the great controversy. You'll see these wonderful things. Beautiful nebulas. Look at there. Do you know what that, the name of that one is? Orion. That's the great nebula in Orion. It's in the sword of the Orion. It's the middle star in the sword of Orion. And uh, that's a close-up of it. That is the great hole in the sky. In fact, I believe that's the most beautiful thing in the whole sky. An Orion, because in the middle of that, where that bright light is, it's a gigantic hole. And do you know what's going to come down through that hole? The city of God, the New Jerusalem. And, and it's going to come down to this earth, and you and I will probably, on the way to heaven, go through there, and you'll go right in there. Uh, and now, it takes light 600 years to get here from Orion. Will it take us 600 years to get to heaven? No, how long? One week. Isn't that something? We'll be going far faster than the speed of light. And do you think we're going to, God is going to take us to heaven in a vehicle? The answer is yes. What will this vehicle be? It'll be a great big giant what? Chariot. And what will this chariot be made out of? Angels. And do you think this chariot has wings that go up and down? And what will they be made out of? Angels. And do you think the chariot has great big wheels that roll? What are they made out of? Angels. And so we'll be in this chariot and we'll be rolling up through space. Uh, you know, as the wings go up and down, they cry, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And as the wee great wheels roll in this thing, imagine it going up through space with millions of people in it. And do you know anybody that's worthy to drive that chariot? Is Jesus worthy to drive it? He's going to be driving it. If you look at Jesus driving that chariot, would you want to take his place? No, you want him to drive that chariot. And I tell you, just the picture it going up through space to the city of God. And then we get up and we see the city of God in the distance. We get out of the chariot and we have a ceremony. We all get in a hollow square. This is in early writings. And Jesus stands in the middle. He has a ceremony. He gives us all a crown on our head and a harp. And you're going to feel that crown go on your head and you're going to look up into the face of Jesus. And you'll just be looking at him at that moment and he'll just be looking at you, nobody else. It's just you and Jesus. I'm sure we'll thank him for that. And then the harp, when we start playing that harp, do you think you'll have to take lessons? Nope, you'll know immediately, perfectly how to play that thing. And all these millions of people playing and praising God. I tell you, heaven, the first day you're there, uh, it'll keep getting better and better. We can't hardly comprehend that. But that's, that's Orion, where we're going to come from. And this is, this is the basis of all of these great blessings. And we understand why God is going to allow the devil to do all the horrible things he's going to do. It's simply to drive his people very, very close to his side, to his heart. 
and so that we'll appreciate heaven. It says, hope thou in God. For on Calvary's cross, a complete sacrifice was offered for you. Notice the word complete. Nothing else need be done. Eternal joy, a life of undimmed happiness, awaits the one who surrenders all to Christ. When at the foot of the cross, the sinner looks up to the one who died to save him, he may rejoice with fullness of joy, for his sins are pardoned. Praise God. We've come to the end of a perfect day. The Holy Spirit is here. The angels of God are here. And now, as we're in God's presence, we're just going to kneel, and have our closing prayer, and then quietly go out and get those books. Get one, and if you stay and there's any left, then get another one. Pray over it. Put it someplace. And may God bless you. And may we see each other very soon in heaven. Let's kneel for a closing prayer. Thank you so much, dear Heavenly Father, for this wonderful Holy Sabbath day. Thank you that thy Holy Spirit is here and the holy angels and that you love us so much. and You love the people. Thank you for such a message that you've given us to give to the people. It's the only message that can penetrate the TV minds of today. Save all thy people, all the honest ones. Use us for them. And the dear children, use us for the children. And each one, forgive and cleanse us of all sin, we ask. We claim the blood of Jesus right now to forgive and cleanse us of all sin. And now we look up from the foot of the cross to dear Jesus, rejoicing, who died in our place, rejoicing with fullness of joy that our sins are pardoned. Thank you, dear Father, that our sins are gone. Bless us now. Fill us with thy Holy Spirit and use us to reach many souls. Give us thy tender love for souls. And thank you for hearing our prayer and for blessing so wonderfully. Help us be together very soon. In heaven we ask. Thank you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>